Chapter 1 of Little Dog Ready. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Dog Ready by Mabel F. Stryker. How Ready Lost His Head. He was a little black and white dog with a shaggy coat and a waggy tail. He had very polite eyes, which were always watching people to find out what they would like to have him do. Whenever people were kind enough to tell him what they wanted, he would always do it for them if he possibly could, and that is why he was named Reddy. Reddy loved his little master Dick more than anyone in the world, and Dick never wanted Reddy out of his sight, and that is how this story came about. It was a very sad day for Dick and Reddy when Dick fell from the apple tree and broke his arm. Have you ever broken your arm? If you have, you know how much it hurts and how still you have to be. Even then the pain won't go away. Of course Dick wanted Reddy with him every single minute of the day and night. But in the middle of the second night, Reddy felt that he really must stretch his legs while Dick was asleep. He would not have thought of letting his master know that he was in a great need of a little run. But now that Dick was asleep, and he put his nose against Dick's good arm to be quite sure that he was... Reddy stepped out of the open window into the big world. I suppose all would have gone well if Reddy had not met Big Yellow Dog. Big Yellow Dog had always snubbed Reddy frightfully, but even Big Yellow Dogs have their good moments, and this must have been one of them. Big Yellow Dog said, Good evening, and almost stopped. This turned Reddy's head. It would have turned any dog's head. Did you ever have your head turned? You will someday, and when it happens, try hard to look where you are going, for you are always going wrong. Of course, Reddy did not know this, and when Big Yellow Dog said pleasantly, Come along, Reddy went. Faster and faster ran Big Yellow Dog. Faster and faster ran Reddy, although he felt that his legs were getting shorter and shorter. Suddenly, Reddy lost sight of Big Yellow Dog altogether, and then he felt very tired. He sat right down on the pavement, for he knew now that his head had been turned. Of course, he tried to turn it back again, but he was so tired that he only made it worse. Then he tried to run home, but of course he ran in the wrong direction, and when you run home in the wrong direction, a most unpleasant thing happens. You don't get there at all. Reddy ran on and on until he came to a house which he thought was his. You see, he was quite sleepy by this time, and when you have a sleepy turned head, you may as well give up. He wondered why the windows were all closed, but even before he had finished saying, how queer that the windows are not, he was fast asleep on the doormat. He did not wake up until he heard someone talking. Oh, see this darling little dog, said a young lady looking down at him. Then all the family came to look down at him and to say, how cute and what a dear. Now Reddy, as you remember, was a very polite little dog, so of course he wagged his waggy tail and said in his best dog language, How do you do? This seemed to delight everybody, and they gave him breakfast at once. Reddy greatly enjoyed his breakfast, and he thought there would be no harm in staying a few minutes with such very pleasant people, but that is where he made his second bad mistake as you will see. He really should have run away from them as fast as his little legs could carry him, for all at once the young lady said, I'm going to keep this little dog forever. But you can see by his collar, said her mother, that he belongs to someone else. 
I had forgotten to tell you that Reddy wore a nice little silver collar, and on it was written, His name is Reddy because he always is so. It does not say where he belongs, said the young lady with a pout, and I want him. He will not want to stay, said the mother. Then I will tie him up and make him stay, said the young lady quite crossly. Now anyone could see with half an eye that the young lady was going to have her own way. Even Reddy felt that without understanding young lady language. If he had known what dreadful things she was saying, of course he would have run right out of the door. But he did not know, so he only wagged his tail, hoping that would make her feel a little better. He thought that he must do something in return for his good breakfast. The young lady grew crosser and crosser and finally stamped her foot. This made Reddy decide to leave at once, for there is no knowing what may happen to dogs or dishes when anyone begins to stamp a foot. Reddy stood up and said his prettiest goodbye, which was three little barks and then one long one, with tail wagging all the time, of course. In a second he would have been out of the house, but the young lady caught him by the collar and held him. Then, I cannot tell you how much it hurts me to say this, they tied him. Yes, they did. They tied him to an old hook and kept him there for nearly a week. They took him out for a breath of air for a few minutes each day and then put him back in his stuffy prison. End of Chapter 1Chapter 2 of Little Dog Ready by Mabel F. Stryker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ready, a prisoner. Of course, if Reddy had been a dog of the world, he might have found ways to escape. He might have snapped at people or howled all night. Then the father of the family would surely have let him out, for fathers hate to be disturbed at night. But Reddy had always been taught that snapping and growling are very wicked, so he only moaned a little and shed a few dog tears when no one was looking. You see, it is a disgrace to a dog's doghood to be found in tears. Of course, he was not the least bit hungry. How could any dog be hungry shut up all day in a stuffy old room? And then nothing takes away a dog's appetite so quickly as sad thoughts. At first, he did not eat anything, and then he began to have a very queer feeling in his legs. They were such wobbly and uncertain legs that they frightened Reddy. He remembered going once to a dog lecture, where the speaker had said, Fellow dogs, beware of unreliable legs. There is nothing left in life for a dog if his legs go back on him. Reddy remembered that this great dog doctor had given him a number of prescriptions. This was one of them. For rapid running legs... Eat carefully, exercise regularly, and don't ever be cast down. When Reddy thought of these words, he began to eat a little each day and to run around the room for exercise after each meal. Then he tried very hard to cast out his sad thoughts. He would put himself to sleep, saying over and over, I think tomorrow I will get out. Tomorrow I am going to be free. Whenever the young lady talked to him, Reddy tried in all kinds of ways to tell her that he must get to his little master as soon as possible. First, he would lie down at her feet and look up beseechingly in her eyes. After that, he would run to the door, wagging his tail all the time. Then he would come back and beg, Oh, how hard he would beg her to let him go. But she never once understood him, never once noticed he was saying, Oh, dear young lady, please let me go back to my little master. He is very ill and needs me. Don't you see that I belong to him? 
I will do anything in the world for you that an honorable little dog can do if you will only let me go. Perhaps the saddest of all his prison days was the time he really thought she was going to release him. He had wagged his tail especially hard that morning at the door. She had put on her hat, saying, Come on, then. Oh, how happy he was and how hard he tried to thank her. Then came the dreadful minute when she fastened a silver chain to his collar. At first, he broke down completely and moaned and moaned. Then he thought, Perhaps if I walk by her side very nicely, it will soften her heart. And then there is always a chance when out in the great, beautiful, open world. So he walked quite contentedly by her side and waited patiently while she stopped to chat with some other young ladies. But when she said boastingly, Do you see my beautiful new dog? He simply could not stand it. Do you know what he did? He growled, and his growl had a bit of a snap in it, too. This made the young lady very cross, and she decided to take Reddy home at once. When they reached the door, Reddy's eyes would have melted a heart of stone. He knelt to her. He moaned to her. He begged so prettily on his hind legs, but the young lady would have none of it. She pushed him rudely into the dark room and slammed the door. I think that was the saddest moment of Reddy's prison life. But in spite of everything, Reddy never once gave up the hope of getting his chance to escape. And that is why it came. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Little Dog Ready by Mabel F. Stryker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Freedom. It happened this way. One evening, the young lady and her mother had gone to one of those long-lasting parties which do not begin until nearly everyone in the world has gone to sleep. The maid was out too, probably to another party. The fat old cook was so sleepy that she forgot to fasten Reddy to the hook and cord after she had opened the window. Wasn't that lucky? Reddy pretended to be asleep until he heard her slow step on the stairs. Then, quick as a wink, he was out of the window and in the yard. The shortest cut to the street was a dash through the flower bed, and Reddy started to go that way. Then he remembered that really nice dogs were always polite to flowers. Now, the only way a dog can be really polite to flowers is to keep away from them. So Reddy turned and ran around the path. But in spite of this long way around, Reddy was soon on the main road. He must make no mistake now. He must never let his head get turned again. Which was the right direction? The road looked so strange, so dark and lonely, that it was hard for a dog to tell anything about it. Reddy felt that he must not wait a moment, so he started, but he soon heard an owl hooting from a tree nearby. No, no, no! Then Reddy turned and ran in the other direction. From some very far away place he heard, Quite right, Bob White! So he knew that all was well. Now he would soon come to his dear little master's house. On and on he ran along the cool, dark village street until suddenly he saw in the distance the queer-shaped old oak tree that stood by the gray church at the corner. Reddy was very happy, for he knew the way perfectly now. Many a race had he taken to this place with his master Dick. Many a frolic they had had together under that old tree. It took about three minutes more of hard dog running to bring him to the dear green house. He noticed that it looked very dark and lonely. Perhaps all the grown-ups had gone to the party, too. He gave three crisp little joy barks, which always meant to Master Dick, Reddy's here. 
There was no answer at all. So Reddy, with a heavy heart, decided to lie right down by the door and wait until morning. You may be sure that he woke up very early indeed in order to be up before Master Dick. He gave his three joy barks again and again, but no answer came. Just then, Old Rover appeared. He was the oldest dog about that part of town, and he knew everything. Well, 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 he said to Reddy, they have been looking everywhere for you, but now you are too late. Too late, said Reddy. Yes, too late, said Rover severely. The little master was so sick that they took him to the seashore yesterday. Then Reddy was the saddest little dog in the world, and he looked so. It's your own fault, said Rover. Why did you run away? At this, Reddy broke down altogether, tail and all, and sobbed out the whole story. Come, come, said Rover at last. Be a dog and keep up your courage. Try wagging your tail a little. That always helps. So Reddy wagged his tail, and it did help a little speck. Then Rover gave him some breakfast, and that helped a great deal. After breakfast was over, Rover gave Reddy letters of introduction to several traveling dog friends of his in the hope that they might happen to know Master Dick's seashore home. But when night came, a very tired and discouraged little Reddy returned to the lonely house. You see, most of the traveling dogs had already left the city, and the others had sent down word, too busy, or not at home. It was the darkest hour of Reddy's life. Indeed, I do not know what would have happened next if a happy robin had not been still awake, singing, cheer up. When he saw sad little Reddy, as quick as a wink, he made this other verse to his evening song. Chance, chance, chance. Everybody has a chance. Cheer up, be ready and wagging. Cheer up, cheer up. I cannot tell you how much this helped Reddy. He wagged his tail at once and decided he would take a little run in the moonlight so as to be on the lookout for chances. As he ran along, he noticed a great many dogs going by. Dogs he had never seen. Dogs old. Dogs young dogs middle-aged, all in a great hurry. He asked several of them where they were going, but few had time to answer him. One said, aren't you going? And several mumbled something that he could not make out. At last, one very fat and panting dog stopped to rest a minute. Won't you please tell me where you were going? asked Reddy. Why, don't you know? was the answer. This is the 21st of June. Just then another dog came along. Hurry up, you two, or you'll be late, he called out. Come on, said the panting fat dog. Now Reddy had had so much bad luck running about with strange dogs that he only shook his head and said, I don't know anything about it. Don't know anything about it? By my tail, you must be a stranger here, said the panting fat one. Reddy afterwards called him PATH for short, P standing for panting, and F for fat, you see. At midnight on the 21st of June, if it is moonlight, a wonderful thing happens. All the beasts, birds, and flowers in this part of the world meet in an open space near the woods. They have music, dancing, and refreshments. Then the eagle, who is the king of the birds, grants a wish to any animal who has a clear record. The eagle gives the wish to the beasts instead of the birds and flowers because nobody ever has anything against the flowers anyway and they don't care for new experiences. As for the birds, they have so many chances to travel and do interesting things that His Majesty, the eagle, decided to go outside of his own family and give the wish to the four-footers. You see, they get around very little as they have no wings. The animals are not what they once were, Path went on as they hurried along. Last year, no one could get it, and the year before, only one had a chance even to try. Do many want to try? asked Reddy. Not so many as there were in my young days, said Path. 
It's unpleasant being refused, you see, and having all the little things you have done and forgotten thrown in your face. I'd try myself tonight, but I had a bad time a few days ago with an old alley cat. It was all her fault, of course, but I know she will be there tonight to complain of me if I should come forward. It is hard these days, Paff went on, to get a clear record, since they allow all kinds of cats to vote, and even flowering vines and chickens can speak against us. So what is an animal to do? It used to be that an English sparrow's vote counted nothing, but now these worthless creatures have as much to say as we do. Why, no cat has a chance, because the mice are all invited. Times are sadly changed, and poor Paff sighed. End of chapter 3Chapter 4 of Little Dog Ready by Mabel F. Stryker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ready at the Great Gathering. At last they reached the place, and it was a wonderful sight. All the four footed animals sat on the ground in front. The birds were perched on the trees, and the flowers massed themselves around the eagle's throne. Suddenly the birds all began to sing a beautiful song, and the flowers commenced to dance a soft, swaying dance. Then the thrushes sang, Give place, give place to our noble king, whom we all do love and fear. Bow low, bow low, every single thing, and then set up a cheer. At this the flowers bowed their heads, the beasts all knelt, and the birds flew out to meet his royal majesty, the eagle. Then the birds made themselves into two lines, and the great eagle flew between them. He was a savage-looking bird indeed. He wore for the occasion a large crown of red feathers and carried in one of his claws an enormous stick covered with rabbit's fur, which had five large dog teeth at the end of it. Everything and everybody clapped and bowed and cheered. Dogs wagged tails, chickens cackled, roosters crowed, birds sang, and flowers waved themselves. The eagle looked about fiercely, bowed slightly, and seated himself on his throne, which was on a little hill. The entertainment began with a duet given by a wood thrush and a song sparrow. It was very pretty indeed. This was followed by a Virginia reel given by the daisies and buttercups. Then the eagle rapped loudly with his terrible rod and said, Everyone may dance, and everyone did. The orchestra was made up of thrushes, whippoorwills, and woodpeckers. The woodpeckers beat time on the bark of the trees. Sometimes the robins and song sparrows joined. It all sounded very well indeed until some blue jays and roosters started in. Then an old crow commenced keeping time with his caw, caw, caw. This was too much for the eagle, who beat angrily on the oak tree with his rod and stopped the dance immediately. Too much like a jazz band, he shrieked. We want real music here. Jays, roosters, and crows, be silent or leave the dance hall. No cackling and cawing in my orchestra while I am king of the birds. You should have seen the dancing. The flowers kept pretty much to themselves and almost always waltzed. The birds danced a two-step, flapping their wings to beat time and splitting their dances for a bit of a fly now and then. Most of the four-footers toddled. Some did the old-time polka because it used all of their legs evenly, beating four time, you see. Reddy saw that Paff wanted dreadfully to dance and was without a partner, so he asked him. They managed somehow to get about. In fact, many thought Paff's quite awkward out-of-time step was something new, and several young chickens tried to copy it. Then the eagle raised his rod, and immediately the dancing and music stopped. Refreshments are coming next, whispered Faff breathlessly. 
Reddy was glad to hear this, as he had had nothing to eat since breakfast. But Paff was mistaken this time. When all was quiet, the eagle said fiercely, Four-footers asking for wishes will now come forward. We may as well get this part of the program over at once, for from what I hear of the beasts this year, it will take a very short time. Then he tapped his rod three times and said, Ready. Little Reddy started to his feet. This was certainly his great chance, but he wished oh so much that refreshments had come first as his knees were weak from hunger and from pulling around path. A rather handsome black dog arose and a large white cat. There was a terrible silence as they walked slowly around the eagle's throne. All eyes were turned upon them. The nearsighted ones put on glasses which they had brought for the occasion. The white cat, being the only lady of the party, was called first to the throne. After asking her name, age, address, and telephone number, the eagle said, This cat is before you. Has anyone anything against her? Immediately, a dozen English sparrows flew down to the throne and told a dreadful tale about her. They said she had caught and eaten their mother, father, and aunt all in one day. A grapevine also bent forward with leaves outstretched, but the eagle waved it back, saying in a terrible voice, We have had evidence enough. White cat, withdraw. And white cat scudded away. Then the eagle called the black dog, but an old hen stepped up at once and indignantly said, Black dog killed my fluffiest child when she was scarcely out of the shell. At this the eagle took his rod and struck the black dog, saying in his great and dreadful voice, How did you dare to come before me? Of course, that was the end of the black dog, who ran away with his tail between his legs. Then Reddy knew that his time had come. If only his little legs would not give out. When the eagle said sternly, Next, he arose and stood before him. Your name, said the eagle, pointing the dreadful rod directly at him. Reddy, he answered huskily. Then he heard the blue jays laughing and the mockingbirds saying, Reddy, quite scornfully. Of course you are ready, if you are ever going to be, shrieked the eagle. Give your name at once or withdraw immediately. But my name is Reddy. You can see it on my collar, said Reddy, and the excitement made his legs feel stronger. Look at his collar, commanded the eagle, and everyone did. It is true, your royal highness, said the owl. Extraordinary, said the eagle. Extraordinary, said all of the animals, one after the other, and even the hens cackled. Extraordinary. Your age, said the eagle. Eleven months, your majesty, Reddy answered bravely. But when it came to address and telephone number, Reddy gathered up all his courage and plunged at once into his sad little story. Everyone was much interested. Several times the eagle leaned forward and said, Louder! Then all the hens cackled, Louder! Reddy was much excited, though it hurt his throat to pitch his voice so high. You see, he was not at all used to public speaking. However, if you had been there, you would have known that he was making a good impression. It was noticed by many of the animals that the eagle once put his handkerchief to his eyes. There was a great silence when Reddy finished speaking. Then the eagle rose upon his throne, flapped his wings, and spoke in a strangely gentle voice. He said, The wish of this dog shall be granted at once. Everybody cheered wildly. But the owl, standing up and bowing low to the eagle, said, Your Majesty, I beg of you not to allow your feelings to carry you too far. Remember the rules of our great gathering here. Let us see if anyone has anything against this animal. Now the eagle had always a great respect for the owl. Indeed, 
the time he had been obliged to go to Washington to have his picture taken for the new American dollar, the owl had taken his place at this meeting. So the eagle said, Very well. Ready is before you. Who speaks against him? It was very still for a minute. Reddy's heart beat fast as he feared he might have offended a chicken, a cat, or something without knowing it. But no one answered, and the cheering began. Then the owl stepped forward. I hate to seem so particular, he apologized, but I have just been rereading the rules of our great gathering. It says... All animals who are strangers in the neighborhood must be properly introduced and vouched for before any wishes can be granted them. Now Reddy was introduced by Paff, but he must be vouched for by someone else. By that I mean, explained the owl, that someone must speak a good word for him. At this Reddy's heart sank. Who indeed would speak for him? Who knew him here? Then he heard a voice saying, I will speak for him. When he jumped out of the window the other night, he was in a great hurry. The shortest way would have been to step upon my lame shoulder, but he went the long way instead. Now Reddy knew that the largest geranium in the flower bed was speaking. I am an old flower, she continued, but it is the first time a dog has shown me any consideration. Wonderful, said the eagle, waving his rod, when he had so much provocation, too. So much provocation, sang the birds. Much provocation, crowed the roosters and cackled the hens. Much provocation, barked the dogs. Reddy wondered what the large word meant, but felt it must be a friendly word because the eagle looked so kindly at him. Enough, commanded the king of the birds. Ready, state your wish. By this time, Reddy's legs had grown very weak. For one minute, he felt that he must say, I wish for food. Then he remembered that this was his one great chance to get back to his master, Dick. I want to find my master, Dick's seashore home, he said in quite a loud voice. Then his little legs gave right out, and he fell fainting at the eagle's feet. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Little Dog Ready by Mabel F. Stryker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bad news. When Reddy opened his eyes, he found himself in the loveliest little bed in the world. The animals, by digging, gnawing, and scratching, had made a large hollow place in the ground, and the birds had lined it with feathers. Even the flowers had given some of their leaves for the pillow. You have no idea how comfortable it was. The eagle's trained nurse was giving Reddy a teaspoonful of medicine every other minute, a special dog doctor was taking his pulse, and hundreds of birds were standing by waiting for orders. Reddy really felt very comfortable. He is better, said the dog doctor, but not yet on his feet. Of course, that was quite true, was it not? Is there anything you would like? asked the trained nurse. Reddy raised his head and said anxiously, May I still have my first wish granted if I ask for anything else? Certainly, said the eagle. Certainly, said all the others. I very much want something to eat, said Reddy, falling back upon the pillows. Such a commotion as there was then. Twenty bluebirds at once brought in a tray of liver, a course of bones followed, and a large dish of milk was served for dessert. Reddy was a very happy dog indeed. Then the eagle said, We will all have recess and refreshments. Now there was much moving about, eating and talking. Everyone came up to Reddy and spoke to him. Many begged him to make weekend visits. Some asked him to house parties, and all the young dogs wanted his photograph. At last the eagle raised his rod, and everyone came to order. We will now, 
he said in a businesslike manner. Try to find Master Dick's home at the seashore. Reddy then told him all he knew about it, which, of course, was very little. It was a red house near the sea with a pine tree in front of it. That is quite enough, said the eagle. I will send out my messengers to find it. The eagle now called together his trusty messengers. There were five of them, a blue heron for watchfulness, a crow for good judgment, a swift for rapid flight, a night hawk for keen eyesight, and a little sparrow for running the errands. The eagle talked to them all in a low tone for a few minutes, giving them directions and money for the journey. Then the dance began, and who do you think was Reddy's partner this time? Why, the eagle, of course. It is a splendid thing to dance with the king of birds, and a rare thing for a dog. It seemed to be dog night, for the owl, who had not danced for years, stepped out with a dog. The owl knew only one dance, an old-fashioned hop waltz. The dog knew no dance at all. He jostled about on his hind legs. They really looked so ridiculous that some gay young catbirds laughed aloud and called out, Toddle, toddle, don't just waddle. They were immediately cuffed by their elders for such bad manners and made to sit out a whole dance in the dressing room, which was curtained off from the rest of the place by a row of young pine trees. Suddenly, the dance was interrupted by the entrance of the young sparrow who had returned with a telegram for the eagle. Everything stopped at once and the eagle's grandson immediately flew to the top of the great oak tree where his honored grandfather's spectacles had been placed in an oriole's nest for safekeeping. He returned in 20 seconds and found everybody waiting breathlessly. The eagle looked troubled after he had read the telegram. Then he and the owl whispered silently together. Bad news, cawed the crows. Bad news, shrieked the blue jays. Bad news, squeaked the field mice. The noise was terrific, and the eagle waved his rod angrily, crying, Silence! We are having trouble with the moths, butterflies, and bats, he continued sternly, hitting at a restless young pullet. You remember that once we asked them to join our gathering, but the bats behaved so badly by bumping into everything that it broke up the dancing. The moths also were too silly for words. They almost stopped the orchestra by hitting them all the time. As for the butterflies, they went to bed as usual without even taking the trouble to send regrets. Shameful, shameful, hissed everybody. And so, continued the eagle, we have never given them another invitation. Why should we, sang a kingbird shrilly. Why should we, squeaked and piped, barked and crowed, chirped and croaked the whole company. But, the eagle went on, waving his rod for silence, the bats did not like being left out, and now they refuse to carry my messages over their telegraph wires. They have formed a union against us, and I can get nothing through to the sandpiper because it is over a wire which they control. The telegram reads... Refuse to send Sandpiper message unless admitted to meeting tonight. Of course, no one understood a word of this message except the owl, who kept a book of knowledge in his nest and always brought it with him in case it should be needed. He now explained that the message meant that they would not be able to get ready back to Master Dick unless the moths and bats were allowed to come to the meeting that night. He also explained that this telegram had been written by the oldest bat in the world who, for several years, had made his home in the attic of one of the offices of the Western Union Telegraph Company. That is where he learned all the big words to put in telegrams, and also that no self-respecting telegram could have more than ten words in it. The owl explained this very clearly to everyone. He even pointed out the words in the telegram, and they all counted them aloud. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
10. Your Majesty, I think there is but one thing to do, said the owl at last in a firm voice, and that is to grant them admittance tonight. We shall put it to a vote, said the eagle, stepping up to his throne and rapping loudly for order. Then he shouted, all in favor of getting ready home by admitting these bats, moths, and butterflies, say, I. I, shouted everybody and everything. Reddy felt that he ought not to vote on such a delicate matter, but he could not help wagging his tail. Contrary? No, shrieked the eagle. Silence from everybody, for they were quite used to public meetings now, and the wiser birds and beasts always watched the foolish ones and cuffed them if they made a sound. The motion is carried, said the eagle. The owl will now send a telegram to admit them. The message will reach the sandpiper, and all will be right in ten minutes. The owl, being a wise old bird, had the telegram prepared beforehand. It said, Accept terms. Send message to Sandpiper and come at once. If you will count, you will see that this telegram has exactly ten words. Wasn't that very clever of the owl? The ten minutes passed very quickly as everybody was talking in little groups about telegrams. Many tried to write them. You could hear a group of young crows counting the words. Gah! 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 Suddenly, without a word of warning, the oldest bat in the world appeared with four or five foolish moth millers. Of course, no butterflies came. The bat flew immediately toward the eagle and almost knocked off his glasses. Then, after running into the owl, he batted about the dance hall. The millers followed, trying hard to imitate him. The bat next sat for a few moments on a rooster's back and then hit a swallow who was flying across the floor. Finally, without a word of goodbye, he was off again, with the millers flopping feebly after him. Everybody was much relieved to have it all over. Indeed, most of the ladybirds and beasts had been so frightened that they put their handkerchiefs over their heads. The warblers started a song at once, and soon everybody joined in. Z, 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 happy are we, gone are the bats, so remove your hats. The eagle almost smiled as he announced, Now the plans are made for Reddy's departure. He did not even need to rap for silence, for everybody was so interested. My trusty messengers have just telephoned me that everything is all right, the eagle continued. They have stopped for refreshments and rest at the Nighthawk's house and will return shortly. You must start at once with the chipmunks, he said, looking most kindly at Reddy, who came and knelt before him. Good running will bring you to the end of the woods by dawn. I have telegraphed to have your breakfast waiting for you under the last oak tree in the woods. It is to be guarded by the red-headed woodpecker who has kindly consented to give his services. Rest there a half hour, but no longer. Then the swallows will show you the way to the beach. They have promised to fly low so that you will not lose them. About noon, you will meet a field mouse. If she says, ready, you will follow her to a place where your dinner will be hidden. There you will meet the sandpiper, who will take you along the beach until you come to an inlet. You must go the rest of the way alone, as the heron who was to take you has appendicitis. The road, however, is straight ahead and will take you to your master's home. Reddy bowed low before the eagle, barking his thanks again and again, while the chipmunks were putting on their overcoats for the journey. Someone called out, speech, speech, but the eagle put a stop to that by saying that Reddy needed to save his strength for the journey. Just then, an old frog hopped up and gave Reddy the queerest thing. You could never guess what it was. A hot water bag. She said in a croaking voice, I've never really been warm in my life, 
but a hot water bag has been a great comfort to me and has kept me next door to warm. There was nothing for Reddy to do without hurting this old frog's feelings but to accept the bag with thanks. Yet he wondered how he could ever carry such an awkward thing. However, the trained nurse kindly fastened it to his collar, and then he started off with the chipmunks. They heard the animals cheering and calling, Good luck to Reddy! Long after they were out of sight. End of Chapter 5、Chapter 6 of Little Dog Reddy by Mabel F. Stryker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. With the Chipmunks. It was a little hard to follow the chipmunks at first, as they were so very much smaller and could, of course, run like lightning along the woody road. However, they would always stop and wait for Reddy very politely, and several times when they found some nuts under a hickory tree, he had to wait for them. Everything went on pretty well until they reached a funny little cabin in the wood. Here, a dark little creature jumped off the roof and whispered, Peanut butter. Then he was off again, as quick as a wink. Peanut butter! Peanut butter! chattered all the chipmunks and ran after the darting little figure. Up they jumped on the roof and in a moment were out of sight. What was poor little Reddy to do? This delay might upset all his plans. Perhaps they would forget to come back altogether. He knew that chipmunks love peanut butter because he had heard a chipmunk that very evening boasting between dances of stealing into a Boy Scout's tent and prying open the lid of a peanut butter jar. Reddy thought and thought, and finally decided to go around to the cabin door and give quite politely three little barks. They would mean, of course, Reddy, Reddy, Reddy. At first, there was no answer to his call. Then he barked again, a little louder. This time he said, Please, please come. At this, somebody in the house jumped out of bed and, stamping to the window, called out, Get away, little beast of a dog! Then Reddy heard the peanut butter can fall to the floor with a bang, and suddenly out ran the chipmunks, their coats flying behind them. So fast did they run that they did not see Reddy at all until they were about 100 yards away from the house. As soon as they really came to themselves and saw Reddy, they cocked their little heads on one side and pointed their paws towards a little figure vanishing in the distance. He made us do it, they chattered. It was only a few minutes, one of them apologized. You needed a little rest, another remarked. Reddy did feel a little put out by the delay, but he remembered that after all they had offered to be his escorts and had only lost their heads for a few minutes. Had not he too once lost his head? So he only wagged politely when he might have said, If it were not for my barking, you would still be eating that peanut butter. Then they all started on again. To tell the truth, the chipmunks really felt ashamed of themselves and thought that Reddy was behaving splendidly. You would know this by the little things they tried to do for him. Chippy, the oldest, actually kept waiting for him and once admired the spots on his coat. Snippy, the youngest, offered to show him a place where they all had some nuts stored for winter. Of course, that was a foolish offer to make to a dog, but Reddy knew it was meant to be a great attention, so he said at once, I thank you very much, but I think I will not stop tonight, as it is growing quite late. They were getting near the end of the woods now, and all was going beautifully when a sudden flash of lightning was followed quickly by a clap of thunder. Then came a downpour of rain. Drenching everybody in about two seconds. There was nothing to do but take refuge in a hollow log nearby. That is to say, the chipmunks went in while Reddy curled up underneath a rhododendron bush, which kindly acted as an umbrella. 
At first, the chipmunks seemed to fuss a good deal and complain about being crowded. Reddy remembered how much they loved to chatter, so he barked, Speech! Speech! Everyone, make a speech! These words acted like magic. Such a jabbering never before was heard from a hollow log. Chippy recited a poem he had written about himself. Snippy told of an adventure he had had with a gray squirrel, and as for Clippy, he just squeaked and thrashed about saying, Here, here, nuts, nuts. It was all rather mixed up, as you can guess, and it sounded something like this. I am Great Big Chippy. My brother's name is Snippy. Here, here, nuts, nuts. And the old gray squirrel put his tail in my face. When something is the matter, I'm always sure to chatter. Nuts, nuts, here, here. Then I jumped on the gray squirrel's back, giving him a tremendous whack. By this time, the rain had stopped, and a tiny streak of light was coming in the east. The chipmunks suddenly ceased chattering, ready pricked up his ears. Everything in the world was very still. Far, far away in the distance, you could hear the birds beginning to wake up. Dawn is coming, whispered Chippy, and we are not yet out of the woods. Without another word, they were all scampering along the road. Reddy had never gone so fast in his life. On and on they went. It was a race with the coming dawn. Five minutes of wonderful animal running brought Reddy to the edge of the wood, and just as they reached the last oak tree, the beautiful rose-colored light had come behind the purple hills. Reddy whispered a thank you to the chipmunks and an invitation to visit him for a weekend as soon as he found his master's home. The chipmunks put their little heads to one side and then curtsied. They were really quite polite little creatures when they remembered to be. They were gone before you could say Jack Robinson, and Reddy was left alone, waiting for his breakfast under the last oak tree in the forest. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Little Dog Reddy by Mabel F. Stryker this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Journey with the Swallows Reddy had scarcely been there a moment before a red-headed woodpecker came out of his hole and rather sleepily rang a breakfast bell. It sounded like this, punk, pink, pink, and it meant come to breakfast. Reddy answered at once with three of his most cheerful barks, ready, ready, ready. Then the woodpecker saluted him and flew down to a little mound covered with fresh leaves. Under this was a delicious dog breakfast. After a pleasant little chat, the woodpecker told Reddy that he would have time for a 15-minute nap and promised to call him. You remember, the eagle had told him that he might be able to manage a half-hour's rest at this place. So, after his good breakfast, Reddy was very glad to stretch himself out on the ground. He was sound asleep in three seconds, and, oh, how he did hate to get up when the woodpecker first tapped. He was very tired, and his feet ached dreadfully, but after the third, punk, pink, pink, Reddy remembered what it was all about and was on his feet at once. The swallows should be here by this time, said the woodpecker in a troubled voice. I think I must telephone to find out what is the matter. After he had hung up the receiver, which was hidden in a curled up oak leaf, the woodpecker said, Bad news indeed. One of the mother swallows has a frightful pain and cannot be left alone. Then Reddy knew why he had carried the frog's hot water bag all this time. He had wanted very much to drop it on the way, as it had been so warm and heavy. Moreover, some large bats had called out as he passed, What is it? What is it? He now went at once to Mother Swallow's house, which was in the hollow of a tree nearby, and put the hot water bag on her pane. You have no idea of the relief it gave her. Wasn't it good that Reddy had not thrown it away? Mother Swallow was then quite willing to have Father Swallow and the children go on with Reddy. 
even Fluffy Forked Tail, the youngest in the family, went along. Reddy and the Swallows soon made up for lost time. The Swallows were very polite, always waiting for Reddy and flying low to show him the way. Everything seemed to be going very well indeed, and Reddy's heart was full of hope. The sun was getting higher and higher, and he knew that it would soon be noon. The swallows had stopped for a few minutes to rest on a telephone wire, and Reddy was panting a little on the ground below when suddenly a splash was heard in a pond nearby. This was followed by a great sputtering and twittering and a call for help. Father Swallow looked quickly about and saw that his youngest child was missing. Oh, why did I ever let him come, moaned Father Swallow as he flew to the rescue. He has only just learned to fly, and I fear his wings have given out. In a moment, they were all around the pond, and sure enough, there was Fluffy Forked Tail in the water. Fortunately, he had managed to climb up on a big lily leaf, or he would have drowned before any help arrived. Reddy swam in at once and let poor Fluffy get on his back. In a few moments, both were safe on the shore, and all the other swallows twittered about them. There was a family consultation at once, and then Father Swallow said to Reddy, my child is suffering from nervous exhaustion, and I fear we must consult a physician at once. I have heard that there is a good doctor among the barn swallows about half a mile from here. I am sending my two oldest sons over there to try to find him. The other two children are making a bed for poor little Fluffy, and I must stay by his side and fan him until the doctor comes." This is a most unfortunate delay for you, Reddy, but I fear that it would be impossible for you to find your way alone. Reddy felt very much disheartened, for this delay might spoil everything. The field mouse might grow tired of waiting. The sandpiper might fly home again. And then how could he ever get to his dear master's home? Indeed, he almost broke down, so great was his disappointment. But as he looked into Father Swallow's worried and anxious face, he decided that he was quite selfish to be so full of his own affairs. He arose and, pulling himself together, said, Surely there must be something that I can do to help. Indeed, there was much to do, and Reddy soon found his heart getting lighter as he helped the swallows carry feathers and twigs to make the little bed by the pond. Of course, this carrying of twigs and feathers was not a dog's work, and once a little spaniel from a field nearby barked, Baby! Baby! It was hard indeed not to run after him and give him a good whipping, but this time Reddy kept his head by saying to himself in a low tone over and over again, My master Dick is waiting, waiting, my dear, dear master Dick. This helped wonderfully. In a few minutes, the little bed was made. It was a lovely soft one, beautifully lined with feathers brought from a chicken yard nearby. Fluffy Forked Tail felt better immediately, and when two of the swallows, who had been watching on the telephone wire, twittered excitedly, They are coming! He roused himself and chirped, Good! Good! Dr. Barnswallow, who looked very handsome in his beautiful buff vest, turned out to be a very good physician. He took Fluffy's pulse and gave him a tablet at once. Then he said, He will be better in a few hours, but must have a good sleep now. After that, he must go home and remain in bed the rest of the day. Reddy's heart sank at these words, but he again pulled himself together. Father Swallow told the doctor about Reddy, and the doctor listened with great interest, saying every now and then, Certainly, and, of course. When Father Swallow had finished, the doctor threw away the cigar he had been smoking and was silent for a moment. Then he said, I think it will be quite safe for you to go on with Reddy and leave the children here to take care of the patient. He must sleep anyway and only needs someone about to see that he is not disturbed. You will be back in time to take him home. 
Oh, how ready loved Dr. Barn Swallow for those words. Even to this day, he never passes a barn swallow without saluting most politely and asking if he can be of any service. And so it was all settled. Soon the goodbyes and thank yous were said, the doctor's fee was paid, and Reddy and Father Swallow were speeding along the meadow road. Reddy was afraid that it was too late for the field mouse to appear. He felt that it must be long past noon. So he was greatly excited when he saw one scudding along the road and was about to run after it and say, I am ready. Are you waiting for me? But Father Swallow laid a detaining wing on his shoulder, saying, The eagle's directions are to wait until the field mouse says, Ready. There are some bad little fellows about here that might lead you astray and then pick your pockets. So Reddy had to content himself with going quietly along, but his eyes were eagerly watching both sides of the road. Several field mice passed him and stared quite rudely, but none of them said a word to him. Just as they came to a turn in the road, Reddy stopped short, for there, lying under a toadstool, was a field mouse, fast asleep. Reddy gave a tiny bark. At least he thought there would be no harm in that. The field mouse awakened immediately, blinked, and then squeaked, Reddy? Oh, how happy our little dog felt. His heart grew so light that he did not feel it at all. Father Swallow patted him on the back and said goodbye at once, promising to send him a postal as soon as his son was better. The field mouse apologized for having fallen asleep and guided Reddy to a dinner of nice meaty bones in an old pan near a barn. You were so late coming, she said, and the sun was so warm that I somehow lost myself for a few moments. It is just as well you are late as the sandpiper telephoned that his wife had a seamstress this morning, and so he could not get here on time. You must wait here until you hear him calling you from the beach. With these words, the field mouse said goodbye and scudded off through the long grass. End of chapter 7。Chapter 8 of Little Dog Ready by Mabel F. Stryker。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。A Dreadful Visitor。Ready finished his dinner slowly, stretched himself out in the grass, and waited for the sandpiper to appear. He was quite near the beach now and knew, of course, that the sandpiper would take him along the water's edge. How he hoped he would not have a long wait. Life lately had been so full of waiting, waiting, nothing but waiting. He began to feel very sleepy, and then suddenly he heard something laugh. It was not a pleasant laugh. It was low and harsh and disagreeable. Reddy started up and found the queerest creature gazing down at him. It looked something like a bird, something like a bat, and not unlike a rooster. It had dreadful colors on it, reds and greens and queer purples that somehow reminded you of all the unpleasant things you had ever seen. When the creature laughed, it reminded you of all the unpleasant things you had ever heard. The sandpiper won't come, it said hoarsely. The bats never sent him the message. I'm a relative, and I guess I know. But he promised, said Reddy. Nonsense, snarled the creature. What's a bat's promise worth? The sandpiper will never come, and as for you, you will go on and on and never get anywhere. Oh, 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 said Reddy, and then something went crack. Whack! Thack! He jumped up and looked about. Not a thing was there. His bones ached, his tail felt bent and queer, and his eyes were heavy. Why, I do believe I have been asleep, he said. It's all a dream, a kind of nightmare. Although the sun is shining so brightly, I suppose it should be called a daymare. He arose, blinked, 
stretched his legs, and shook himself to keep his heart from getting too heavy. The sandpiper will come. The sandpiper will come, he said. Then he looked down the beach, and away off in the distance, he saw a little dark moving object. Then he heard a low, sweet call. Peet-tweet! Peet-tweet! That, said Reddy with a joyful bark, is the sandpiper. And it was. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Little Dog Ready by Mabel F. Stryker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Journey with the Sandpiper. The Sandpiper arrived in about one more minute. He made many apologies for being late. You see, my wife has a seamstress today, he said. They have been very busy making over the children's summer suits, and I have had to do all the housework. The children play so much in the little pool that they wear out their clothes very quickly. Mr. Sandpiper was a very pleasant traveling companion, although it must be said that he had some queer habits. He would run along the beach very rapidly and then stop for a few minutes and teeter while talking to Reddy. His voice was very sweet and low. Reddy greatly admired his neat and slender body, his very neat and slender legs, and his particularly neat and long slender bill. By this time, Reddy, having had so much experience with so many different birds and beasts, knew very well how to entertain them. He asked Mr. Sandpiper, quite naturally, if he had a comfortable home this year. Very comfortable indeed, thank you, was the reply. It has the best lining we have ever had. And then Mr. Sandpiper was off for a drink in a pool nearby. He flew above Reddy in a rather jerky fashion and at last alighted on a little rock and commenced teetering again. Our nest is a little farther from the water than usual, he continued, and then was off again for another drink. Indeed, it was quite difficult to follow him, either in movements or conversation. Things were going along pretty well, however, when Mr. Sandpiper stopped short right in the middle of a sentence and a teeter. What's that? he said anxiously. Reddy listened, but heard nothing. There's trouble at home. That's my wife's danger call, Mr. Sandpiper exclaimed, and then Reddy did hear a low, frightened, far-away little peep. Away flew Mr. Sandpiper in his queer, jerky fashion, while Reddy followed him as rapidly as he could, and then quite suddenly there appeared the strangest sight that Reddy had ever seen. Two boys were walking along the beach, and in front of them on the sand lay Mrs. Sandpiper, flopping about on one wing in a very pitiful way. She would wait until the boys had almost caught her before she would raise herself and fly a little further away from them. Then she would flop again. She is not really hurt, you know, whispered Mr. Sandpiper, but those dreadful boys want to rob us of our home, and she is trying to lead them away from it. I must fly over and look after the children, who have probably been told to hide under some leaves. He was off without another word and disappeared behind a tall rock. At first the boys thought it was great fun to try to catch the Sandpiper, but after failing to do it several times, they began to grow tired. Oh, let's go away, said one. I believe she is just trying to fool us. I have heard that they do that sometimes. I am sure the nest is nearby, said the other boy. I heard something over there. So the boys turned away from Mrs. Sandpiper and went over toward the little rock. Reddy knew that something must be done or they would surely find the nest. Mrs. Sandpiper gave a frightened little peep, which said, Oh, please, please, somebody do something to save my home and children. It took all Reddy's courage, but it must be done. It was against his bringing up, against his highest principles, against good taste in dog circles, but it must be done. He ran barking at the two boys. He did not wait for them to protect themselves with sticks and stones, but growling and showing his teeth, 
he made a spring towards them. The boys ran off with Reddy close upon them. He must finish up the work now and get them really out of the way. On and on ran the boys. On and on went Reddy, growling and barking savagely all the time. You would have thought he was the most snappy, vicious little dog in the world if you had heard and seen him then. But all the time he was running, his heart was growing heavier and heavier. Something seemed to be saying to him, You will lose the way. Go back. Go back. And something else seemed to be answering, But every dog must do his duty. At last, they came to a rather rocky part of the beach, there was one very high, queerly shaped rock, and the boys quickly climbed over it and tried to hide behind it. Here's a good place to turn around, Reddy decided. I'll pretend to have lost them and run back now. But just as he turned and started on the backward stretch, he felt a sharp stinging pain in one of his legs. A horrid little sharp stone had hit him, and then came another, almost touching him. The boys were now taking their revenge. In spite of the sharp pain, Reddy knew that he must not linger here or let them see that he had been hurt, so he ran bravely along, holding his head proudly, never once letting those mean, cowardly boys know that anything was the matter. The pain began to grow very bad, and Reddy felt that he must stop somewhere soon, but there was no sheltered spot in sight. The sunny beach stretched out before him for miles and miles. At last, he saw another sandpiper taking a drink in a tiny pool in one of the rocks. Reddy limped up to him and asked him if he knew any shady spot where he could rest for a few minutes. You see, he knew sandpiper language very well by this time. The sandpiper, after jerking himself about, remembered a nice little place behind a rock about a quarter of a mile away. He guided poor limping Reddy to it, and then Reddy told him all about his difficulties. The sandpiper was very much interested. I think I know your guide quite well, he said, and I will fly back and tell him where you are. He is a neighbor of mine. Hasn't he a particularly large black spot right in the middle of his white shirt front? Wasn't it splendid that Reddy remembered this very spot? He had noticed it during Mr. Sandpiper's first teeter. As you see, Reddy was really a very observant little dog. After the Sandpiper had gone and Reddy was left all alone with the pain, it felt very bad indeed. Life seemed pretty hard. There was always something unpleasant happening to him. He wondered if he would ever really reach his journey's end. Perhaps his leg would grow worse and worse. He had heard of legs that did do that. Perhaps, but just then from right around the corner, a big shaggy brown dog appeared. Reddy was a great judge of dogs. Indeed, he had been brought up with them, and one look in this dog's face told him he had found a friend. He was such a kind-eyed dog, with understanding ears and tail. Reddy knew at once that this dog was years older than he, and that he would know all about lame legs. "'You are suffering,' gently barked Shaggy Dog. At this, Reddy gave up and moaned out his story. Shaggy Dog's eyes grew kinder and kinder. In a moment, he had looked at the poor leg and had made it much more comfortable by a little licking. Then he had Reddy bathe it in a pool nearby and gave him the best medicine in the world. Do you know what it was? He gave him back his courage. Your leg will feel much better in a half hour, he said, and you will be able to go along easily. Your sandpiper friend will soon be here, and I will stay with you until he does come. You have made a wonderful journey, and from what you tell me, I know you must be nearly there. Be thankful that the very last part of your journey you can take alone, for then you need have no interruptions. Reddy was much comforted, and his leg began to feel a great deal better. 
Shaggy Dog told Reddy that he would gladly go with him to the end of his journey, but his business, as the oldest dog in the neighborhood, was to carry dog messages and to look after things generally all along the beach. This afternoon, he was taking a special delivery to a young collie some distance away. It was a message from his grandfather to say that he was coming that night to spend the weekend. The young collie must know about it this afternoon in order to get some special food ready for his grandfather, whose teeth and digestion were very poor. Then Shaggy Dog, seeing that Reddy was still a little nervous, recited some dog poetry he had made. It went something like this. If you have a lame leg, you won't have to beg. Forget the old stone and think of a bone. Instead of a moan, say, soon I'll be home. Do you know what happened? Reddy was asleep in a few minutes. When he awakened, Shaggy Dog was smiling down at him, and Mr. and Mrs. Sandpiper, with three of the children, were twittering above his head. As soon as they saw that Reddy was awake, they flew toward him. Then Mother Sandpiper, in a pretty little song, thanked him for saving all the family from destruction. Father Sandpiper joined in the last two lines, and at a signal from their mother, the little Sandpipers joined in the chorus. It sounded to Reddy something like this. Pete tweet Pete tweet you deserve much meat. Pete tweet Pete tweet soon you'll be on your feet. After all the handshaking and goodbyes were over, Reddy found out that his leg was about well, and Mr. Sandpiper and he started off again. He hated to leave old Shaggy Dog, but had to be satisfied with the promise of a visit from him on the very first day of his vacation. As they went along, Mr. Sandpiper explained that he would have followed Reddy immediately if he had not found Mrs. Sandpiper in hysterics, and it had taken some time to quiet her. He said he was quite proud of the children who had stood motionless under some tall weeds during the terrible danger. At last, Reddy and Mr. Sandpiper came to a place where a long straight road lay before them. This was the place where the sandpiper had to leave him. He carefully explained how easy it was to follow the road. He said, You remember that the heron was to go with you and show you a shortcut through the marshes. Perhaps it is just as well for you that he had appendicitis, as he always stops a long time to get his evening meal. Then, if he is startled, he flies at once to a tree. Moreover, he is rather apt to pick a quarrel. It is thought by some of the best authorities in Birdland that his appendicitis came from eating too heartily one night and quarreling violently afterwards. It was after twilight when the sandpiper finally said goodbye and left Reddy alone on the long, dark road. End of Chapter 9《Chapter 10 of Little Dog Ready by Mabel F. Stryker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The End of the Lonely Road There had been no arrangement made for Reddy's supper, as the eagle had expected him to be home by dark. At first Reddy was so relieved to be alone and have no one to delay him that he gave no thought at all to supper. It was wonderful to be free, to have no animal or bird to entertain, to be able to go on and on rapidly along a straight road. But after a time, this going on and on grew a little difficult. Thoughts of supper would keep coming. Little side roads kept beckoning to him and whispering, This way for food. Then he commenced to feel the pain in his leg, but did not dare to stop and rest for fear he would be too lame to get up again. So on through the darkness little Reddy ran, keeping his eyes straight before him, never stopping a moment, so great was his fear of losing his head or falling asleep. I must try to keep the courage that dear old shaggy dog has given me, he said to himself. Then there came to him these lines, Instead of a moan, say, Soon I'll be home. 
Much to his surprise, he found himself adding, I shall keep on the run till the journey is done. I shall not once stop until I just drop on Master Dick's bed in the small cottage red. Reddy felt wonderfully proud of himself to have made up this verse and decided to have it published some day in the Dog Biscuit Weekly, which was considered the very best dog magazine. Suddenly there was a rustle in the bushes, and an enormous black dog appeared. He was not a pleasant dog to look at or talk to. Any dog of good standing could feel that at once. He went up to Reddy and said, Come with me, and your fortune is made. Reddy did not even slow up as he answered coldly, I have no time to make my fortune. I must get to my master Dick tonight. The black dog came nearer. Don't let such a chance go by, he whispered. It means bones for months and liver as long as you live. Oh, why did he mention liver, thought Reddy. He was so hungry, and it was his favorite food. But something sang to Reddy. I shall keep on the run till my journey is done. So he turned sharply toward the black dog, saying as he ran, Go away at once. Do you suppose I would let you keep me from seeing my master tonight? Suppose I make you come, said black dog in an ugly voice. Reddy looked at the black dog. He looked at him from head to foot, and then with a growl he made a step towards him. Do you know what happened? The black dog turned and ran away as fast as he could. You see that in spite of his large size and big voice, he was a coward. Many large-sized, big-voiced things are. It was growing late now. Even the stars were getting sleepy, and Reddy was the weariest little dog in all the world. He had come now to a village, and he began to look anxiously for the red cottage with the pine tree in front of it. On and on he went, past brown houses, white houses, green houses, past everything. Oh, where was it? Now there were no houses left. Reddy felt the tears coming to his eyes. He had been looking so long and so eagerly, his legs ached terribly. How could he keep on? Then something sang to him. Instead of a moan, bark soon, I'll be home. There was a sudden turn in the road, and there, right before him, it stood. The red house and the big pine tree. And yes, oh yes, there was a light in the window. He had reached his journey's end. They were home. Reddy suddenly felt very strong and happy and not at all tired. He came softly up to the lighted window. There sat Master Dick's father and mother. The father was saying, How's the little fellow tonight? The mother answered, He's trying very hard to be brave, but he can't forget little Reddy. Do you know he insists upon having the window nearest the bed always open? Poor little fellow, I fear that he cries himself to sleep after I leave the room. Reddy didn't wait to hear another word, but ran at once to that open window. In the dark room lay a little boy with wet eyes. I'm not being a soldier, he was whispering to himself, but I can't help it. Oh, Reddy, Reddy, if I could just have you for a minute. Then there were three little barks, and a waggy tail was on Master Dick's nose. There was a cry of joy from a little boy, and a bark of delight from a little dog. Then a happy child's voice was heard all over the house, calling, Mother, Father, everybody! Reddy's come back. End of chapter 10. End of Little Dog Reddy by Mabel F. Stryker.